that once again that he can be our teacher. So we commit our lives into your hands. We also ask for forgiveness for our sins. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, at this point we will uh, look at the seven last plagues. And I must confess it's not really a common subject. Back in Fiji, I don't know about over here. But uh, <coughs> we'll start from Revelation 14.9. Eh? The third angel's message. It says, and the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, if any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. So the question, where can we find the wine of the wrath of God, which comes immediately after the third angel's message? has been proclaimed, okay? I mean, the, the closing up of the three angels' messages. Uh, and this, uh, before we move on, this is why the three angels' messages are the present truth for this time. Amen. Okay? See, different era, you have different, the emphasis on different aspects of the truth. But the final one, the three angels' messages. Because immediately after that, the wrath of God, God falls. That's it. Okay, Revelation 15, verse 1. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the... Right, that's where the wrath of God is. That's the warning from the third angel is concerning this. Just following, okay? The three angels of mercy, first, second, third angel, message, are followed by the seven angels of wrath. All right. Daniel, see, one thing we have to understand with the book of Revelation, all the books in the Bible, all the different books, starting from Genesis, come down, they all meet and they end in the book of Revelation. Okay? It's like a composite book made up of verses from all the different books of the Bible. All right, Daniel 12, verse 1. And at that time, okay, shall Michael stand up. Who's Michael? Jesus. Jesus, all right. The great princess which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. And at that time, Thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. Okay? See, Jesus is our mediator. He is also a judge. Okay? When the judge, was that uh, Henny? Uh, Michael is the archangel, is another title for Jesus. Eh? Yeah. All right. So he's like the judge and our mediator. And when the judge stands up, what does that signal? Is the court still in progress? It's over. Close. Okay. And just after that, what is there? A time of trouble such as never was. That's where your seven last plagues come in. Okay. And that's the time that God's people will be delivered. Okay, so my, uh, Daniel just sum it up like that in one verse. 
Early Writings, page 281. I saw Jesus lay off his priestly attire and clothe himself with his most kingly robes. Upon his head were many crowns, a crown within a crown. Surrounded by the angelic host, he left heaven. The plagues were falling upon the inhabitants of the earth. Okay. So that's straight after the close of probation. Okay. Jesus leave heaven, the plagues are starting to fall too. Simultaneous, eh? And uh, <coughs> if you're familiar with Revelation chapter 22, verse 11, let the filthy be filthy still. Let the righteous be righteous still. Does that signal the close of probation? And then in verse 12, and behold, I come quickly, second coming. So that little gap between verse 11 and verse 12, that's when all these things are happening. Okay, Revelation 16, verse 1, and I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. Now, you think, is, you think this is like a, something that God enjoyed? You think it's something that, that he do instantaneously, or does he think about it for a long time and then he does it? Okay, Nahum chapter 1 verse 3, the Lord is slow to anger. Okay? It's not a fast kind of thing and great in power, and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord hath his way in the whirlwind and in the storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. Okay. So here we see that even though God is love, he's great in power, but at the same time, God is just. He will not excuse sin, Whatever we sow, we shall reap. Early writings, page 64. I was then made capable of enduring the awful sight of the seven last plagues, the wrath of God. Terror seized me, and I fell upon my face before the angel and begged of him to cause the sight to be removed, to hide it from me, for it was too dreadful. Then I realized as never before the importance of searching God's word carefully to know how to escape the plagues. It was a great wonder for me that any could transgress the law of God and tread down his holy Sabbath when such awful threatenings and denunciations were against them. <clears throat> great Controversy 627. To our merciful God, the act of punishment is a strange act. You know, I'm not sure whether you got it here, but we have some people back home. That their, their view of a God is love doesn't accommodate any of this. But we have to understand God is love and God is just. If we want to go against him, we will get punished. Exodus chapter 33, verse 11. What is God's will for you and I? Say unto them, as I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn away from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will you die, O house of Israel? Friends, this will only take place, the seven last plagues, when God has exhausted every means possible for you and I to come to repentance. Nothing left. We just refuse to be saved. Okay, so let the process go. Isaiah 28 verse 21. For the Lord shall rise up as in Mount Perazim. He shall be wroth as in the valley of Gibeon, that he may do his work, his strange work, and bring to pass his act, his strange act. Okay? So it's like out of care, it's not something that he does commonly, usually strange. 
Okay, let's look at the first plague. First plague, Revelation 16 verse 2. And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast, and upon them which worshipped his image. All right, this is the quotation here. Acts of the Apostles 585. In the Revelation, all the books of the Bible meet and end. See that first plague verse that we read from Revelation 16, the one, or this one? Okay, we'll find it again in Zechariah. Okay? 14, verse 12. And this shall be the plague wherewith the Lord shall smite all the people that have fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall consume away while they stand upon their feet. And their eyes shall consume away in their holes. And their tongue shall consume away in their mouth. So that's the first one. A noisome f uh, saw, putrefying boils, oh yeah, covered all over. The second plague, Revelation 16 verse 3. And the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea, and it became as the blood of a dead man, and every living soul died in the sea. Revelation 11 verse 6, talking about the two witnesses. This is the chapter about the French Revolution, the Old and the New Testament. These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy and have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. Okay. Okay, number three. Revelation 16, 4. And the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and the fountains of waters, and they became blood. Verse 5. And I heard the angel of the water say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and wast and shall be, because thou hast judged thus. So the seven last plagues that we're going with up to number three now have had their shadows in the plagues which God sent on slave holding Egypt. Now, normally I just use the Bible and the spirit prophecy. Now and then I'll bring in William Miller's, and this is one of them, from his book on Evidence, page 219. And this is what the spirit prophecy says about Egypt. Page 265, Patriarchs and Prophets. The overflowing of the Nile, being the source of food and wealth of all Egypt, the river was worshipped as a god, and the monarch came hither daily, to pay his devotions. Okay, so the third plague concerns the waters, okay? All right, Revelation 16, 5. And I heard the angel of the waters say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which... Okay, we've seen this one. Verse 6. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. Verse 7, and I heard another out of the altar say, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are thy judgments. See that terminology there, that term there, out of the altar, a voice coming out from the, you know, from the altar. You see it in the fifth trumpet or fifth seal? Fifth, fifth seal, the voice coming out of the, the foot of the altar. How long, O Lord, wilt thou take, and then you shall avenge? Come on, you might recall that. Well, here, the voice saying, oh, okay, so it's going on now. Thank you, O Lord. Uh, maybe after this, just keep it in. Okay, number four, uh, verse eight. And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. Okay. Matthew chapter 13, verse 6. When the sun was up, they this is a parable told by Jesus about, you know, 
stony ground, thorny ground, and so on, the sowing of the seed. Okay, the one with the stony ground. When the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. Okay? So the hearers, the stony ground hearers, they got scorched, they died, the plants died when the sun was up, because they had no root. Now, as in our Christian life, what are our roots? Ephesians 3, okay, rooted and grounded in love, okay, all right, so we better make sure we, we get that right now, otherwise we'll have no roots on that day. In receiving the mark of the beast, the National Sunday Law, the world rejects which commandment? The fourth one, and indirectly pays homage to the sun, so the fourth plague will deal with the sun, okay? And a lot of people worship it, so now their God gonna turn around and scorch them again, okay? Okay, how are God's people? Okay, how about God's people? During the time of the plagues, will we be affected? We will to a certain extent. Great Controversy 630. The people of God will not be free from suffering. But while, and, there, and that's a very good sign there when it says, but. But while persecuted and distressed, while they endure privation and suffering, and suffering for want of food, they will not be left to perish. Okay. Psalms 121 verse 5, the Lord is thy keeper, the Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. So when that sun is very hot, Okay, the Lord will shade his people. Yeah, I mean, he did it in the wilderness with that cloud in the daytime. Okay? He'll do it again during the time of the plagues. Psalms 121 verse 6. The sun shall not smite thee by day, nor the moon by night. So we have all these promises available for us. When we hit the time of trouble, we should really not, be get, not get caught by surprise, you know? That's why Brother Peter was emphasizing how we need to have these memory verses, these promises. Okay, Great Controversy 630. Yet to human sight, it will appear that the people of God must soon seal their testimony with their blood. See, friends, this time of plagues will not only be rough for the wicked, but it will be rough for God's people too. It's a time, you know, people will be search, soul searching and all going on. Remember, this is the time of Jacob's wrestling. And that was not easy for Jacob, the original one. They themselves begin to fear that the Lord has left them to fall by the hand of their enemies. It is time, a time of fearful agony. Day and night they cry unto God for deliverance. Because by this time, do we have a mediator in heaven? He's out. He's out. And same time, he pulled out from heaven, from the most holy, the mediator on earth is also withdrawing the Holy Spirit. So now, Jeremiah 30 verse 6, Ask ye now and see whether a man doth travail with child. Wherefore do I see every man with his hands on his loins as a woman in travail, and all faces are turned into paleness? Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble. But, praise the Lord for that, but, but he shall be saved out of it. Hosea 12 verse 4 talking about Jacob's experience in the wilderness. Yea, he had power over the angel and prevailed. The same way that Jacob prevailed during that night of wrestling, God's people will also prevail during the time of the seven last plagues. And he made, he wept and made supplication unto him. He found him in Bethel. There he spake with us. Okay, Revelation 16, 9, And men were scorched with great heat and blasphemed the name of God 
which hath power over these plagues, and they repented not to give him glory. Friends, by the time they reach plague number four, that's when the wicked start to realize, hey, this thing is coming from God. And they actually turn around, they even become more hardened, you know. Number one, number three, I think they were putting it to climate change, putting all kind of reason. By the time reach number four, oh no, this is coming from God. Under the fourth plague, men realize they are fighting against God and they blaspheme him. Number five, fifth plague. Okay, Revelation 16, 10, and the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast and his kingdom was full of darkness and they gnawed their tongues for pain. Okay, what's this beast here? Who's the beast? Okay, the papacy. Where's his seat? One special plague for that. And, uh, but also not just Rome. The seat of the beast is where the papal see is located, which is Rome. But remember, his kingdom includes the whole world because it says the whole world followed after the beast. Okay? So that plague will also affect the rest outside Rome. The darkness will spread throughout the world. And this is the kind of darkness similar to the one in Egypt, you know. We can almost touch it, it's so suffocating. Matthew chapter 8, verse 12. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast where? Into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Patriarchs and prophets. 272, the sun and the moon were objects of worship to the Egyptians. In this mysterious darkness, the people and their gods alike, both, were smitten. This judgment is evidence of God's unwillingness to destroy. He would give the people time for reflection and repentance before bringing upon them the last and the most terrible of the plagues. So when you come to the halfway point, give one little pause. Okay, off the lights, everything full dark. The only thing the people can do, they can't see, they can't do anything else. All they can do is just think, why am I here? Number six. Revelation 16, 12. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great Euphrates. And the water thereof was dried up that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. Okay, the drying up of the river Euphrates during the sixth plague, uh, preceding the fall of the papacy, is similar to the events leading to the fall of ancient Babylon. Okay, when you look at history, how did the original Babylonian empire fall during the time of King Belshazzar? Okay, Cyrus, was it Cyrus? Diverted with his armies, diverted the river Euphrates, the water went and the thing dried up. And that water flowed under the walls of the city, right through, provided there was water, everything. And that's how, that was the beginning of the fall of Babylon. And when it dried up, the armies of Darius, which were surrounding the city, they marched on. So the fall of original Babylon has parallel lessons in the fall of the papacy in these last days. Number one, what does it mean for the waters to dry up, okay? Okay, waters represent multitudes, nations, all the ground support propping up the papacy is just gonna fizzle away when they see the true character. But by that time, it'll be too late for many of them. Okay, anyway, this thing about the original fall of Babylon, eh? There's a prophecy in Isaiah 44, 27, 28, that saith to the deep, be dry, and I will dry up the rivers. That saith of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, and shall perform all my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, thou shalt be built, and to the temple, thy foundation shall be laid. You know, friends, this, this prophecy here, that, that one day King Cyrus would give the decree 
for the Jews to go back and rebuild the, this, the temple in Jerusalem, which was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar around 600 BC. This prophecy was given by Isaiah 100 years before baby Cyrus was born. His actual name there in the Bible. And I don't know where I got this from. A history book or something. It says there that Daniel actually showed Cyrus this prophecy. Look, God has chosen you. I don't know. If I'm wrong there, please correct me. But it's lying there in the scriptures. And Cyrus fulfilled exactly everything that God wanted him to do. He was the one, the first king to give the order for the Jews to go back to their homeland and start rebuilding the temple and all that. 100 years before that little baby was even born. Okay, uh, just joining on from that verse 1, Isaiah 45. Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand have I holden, to subdue nations before him, and I will loose the loins of kings to open before him the two leaf gates, and the gates shall not be shut. So while Belshazzar was having his religious party, or how do you like to describe it, the writing on the wall, one angel came and started writing on the wall, mene mene tekelu fasin, and the spirit of prophecy says that same angel who did the writing was the same one that ripped the veil in two. The time Jesus died on Calvary. Okay. Anyway, while this was going on, the armies were outside and they waited for the, for the river, the water level to go down. They marched through, but you know, along the banks of the river, through the city, there were walls also there with gates, two leaf gates. And if those gates were re remain shut, all the soldiers can do was march in and just go st march smartly out again. They couldn't have taken the city. But mysteriously, these gates were left open, just like how Isaiah prophesied right here in this verse. Okay? And that's how Babylon fell. All right. Let's look at spiritual Babylon, the papacy. How is she going to fall? Friends, the third angel's message will bring the downfall of the papacy. And that's why there's so much opposition to it in the world today. Okay? The water was dried up. Okay, what does the water represent? Revelation 17, verse 15. Peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. She's the majority denomination in this world today. The drying up of the water represents the drying up of the support by these multitudes who have been, had been deluded by the woman and her spiritual daughters. Okay? Mother Harlot and her daughters. And what will happen? Revelation 17 verse 16. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore. So now they turn on the papacy now. And shall make her desolate and naked and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. Unfortunately, that awakening will come too late to reverse the fate of those who will already have been sealed in apostasy and error. Okay? So by the time they come to their senses, too late, the plagues are going on. Great Controversy 656. The people see that they have been deluded. They accuse one another of having led them to destruction. All the finger pointing going on now. But all unite in heaping their bitterest condemnation upon who? The ministers. Unfaithful pastors have prophesied smooth things. They have led their he hearers to make void the law of God and to prosecute those who would keep it holy. The swords which were to slay God's people are now employed to destroy their enemies. Maranatha, two six, chap, oh, chapter or page 263. And as mercy's sweet voice died away, 
fear and horror seized the wicked. With terrible distinctness, they heard the words, too late, too late. Christ on the cross felt much as sinners will feel when the vials of God's wrath shall be poured out upon them. See, this is why the agony of Jesus on Calvary was so intense and acute, because he had the same kind of feeling that sinners will feel at this point of the plagues. Exactly. That's why, you know, sometimes they said, the people always say, oh, he had the second death experience. This is the second death experience. By the time you reach the seven plagues, that's it. There's no hope of salvation. So Christ felt exactly like that. Christ on the cross felt much as sinners will feel when the vials of God's wrath shall be poured out upon them. Black despair like the pall of death will gather about their guilty souls. And then they will realize to the full, fullest extent the self sinfulness of sin. All the deception gone now. Now they see sin in its right perspective. Okay. Okay, Maranatha 263. Those who had not prized God's word were hurrying to and fro, wandering from sea to sea, from north to the east to seek the word of the Lord. Said the angel, they will not find it. Amos 8.11. Eh? There is a famine in the land. Many of the wicked were greatly enraged as they suffered the effects of the plague. It was a scene of fearful agony. Parents were bitterly reproaching their children and children their parents. Brothers their sisters and sisters their brothers. The people turned upon their ministers with bitter hate and reproached them saying, You have not warned us. You have not told us of this hour. And those who warned us of it, you declared to be fanatics and evil men. But I saw that the ministers did not escape the wrath of God. Their suffering was tenfold greater than that of the people. Okay, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. Who are these kings of the east? Matthew 24, verse 27, when Jesus comes, For as the lightning cometh out of thee, east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Okay, verse 13, Revelation 16, And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. Unclean spirits, what are they? They're devils. Interchangeable with devils, eh? Three, okay, the three unclean spirits out of the mouth of the dragon. Okay, start from the dragon. Great controversy 438. While the dragon represents Satan, Revelation 12, 9, it is in a secondary sense a symbol of pagan Rome, in other words, paganism. Okay? That's the dragon. And out of the mouth of the beast, the beast represents Roman Catholicism or the papacy. You can see Revelation 13 and so on. How about the false prophet? Out of the mouth of the false prophet. Okay, apostate Protestantism based in America and eventually enveloped the whole world. Uh, false prophet, right. Revelation 13, 14, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of these miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast. That's pointing to America. You see why America is apostate Protestantism when they take over America, why they'll be known as the false prophet? Because they have the horns of a lamb, but they speak like a dragon. Fallen Protestantism in the U.S. is known as the false prophet of Revelation 16 because she has the horns of a lamb but speaks like a dragon, so deceiving. Great Controversy 588. Through the two great errors, the immortality of the soul 
and Sunday sacredness, Satan will bring the people under his deceptions. While the former lays the foundation of spiritualism, the latter creates a bond of sympathy with Rome. All right, so these three frogs that come out, I mean these frogs that come out of the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet, verse 14 says, they are the spirits of devils, working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. See, one thing that frogs have, one peculiarity okay, about frogs is they catch their prey with their the tongue. And uh, I heard this mentioned somewhere. I mean, you can make up your own mind, but it fits. Spiritualism, the papacy or the system, Catholic system, and fallen Protestantism, all of them are big on speaking in tongues. Okay? So when you do that, that's a sign that you know, you're a believer, you're part of the kingdom and all that. So that's going to be a big deception. It is a big deception already. Okay, the three frogs are the demonic counterpart of the three good angels of Revelation 14. So devil always has a counterfeit, okay? Counterfeit. Three, the three angels' messages, you have the three frogs, the evil spirits deceiving on one side. Both groups of angels have a mission to the whole world. One trio calling the world to worship God and the other seeking to gather the people to worship the beast. And you and I stuck in the middle, who are we going to choose? Okay, six testimonies, 406. The battle of Armageddon is soon to be fought. He on his vesture is written the name King of Kings and Lord of Lords is soon to lead forth the armies of heaven. Revelation 17 verse 14. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful friends. We praise the Lord that the outcome of this whole controversy is already known. We know who's going to be the winner. So really we have no reason to fear. The only thing that we need to fear is that we may forget how God has worked for us in the past. That's the thing that we tackle on. All these are just events that have shown to us in advance that we may, you know, see what's going to happen, prepare accordingly. But you and I, our priority is to make our life right with God right now. Make sure you have a living, personal relationship with Jesus, that your heart is open to him, as to a personal friend. That's the, our priority. Okay? All these things, God can take care of that. Okay? 1911, Revelation, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. You know, there's a time for everything, what the wise man says. Time to build up, a time to tear down, a time for war, a time for peace. Okay, this time for war. That great day of God Almighty. Isaiah 2 verse 17. What's going to happen on that day? And the loftiness of man shall be bowed down. And the haughtiness of man shall be made low. And the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. Praise the Lord. Now, the Lord has a bad name. A lot of people trampling on him. They use it in slang. They, you know, swearing and all using the Lord's name. That day, different story. All the via via levu, all the haughtiness and all down in the dust now. That's the proper position for it. Revelation 16, 15. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Friends, the reason why Jesus is coming is like as a thief because many people are not expecting him. And once again, our priority, make sure you've got the right garments. Okay? White robes of righteousness. 
Last day events, 249. After the transgression of Adam and Eve, they were naked. Why? What happened? For the garment of light and security had departed from them. That's what they lost. All right, verse 16, and he gathered them together in a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. <clears throat> Seven testimonies, one for one. The great conflict that Satan created in the heavenly courts is soon, very soon, to be forever decided. Soon all the inhabitants of the earth will have taken sides, either for or against the government of heaven. Okay, let's look at the final one, number seven. Revelation 16, 17. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. Right. What's this uh, great voice out of the temple? Joel chapter 3 verse 16. The Lord shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem and the heavens and the earth shall shake. But the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. Early writings 15. Soon we heard the voice of God like many waters, which gave us the day and the hour of Jesus' coming. The living saints, 144,000 in number, knew and they understood the voice, while the wicked thought it was thunder and an earthquake. One testimony is 353. I saw that God will in a wonderful manner preserve his people through the time of trouble. Praise the Lord. As Jesus poured out his soul in agony in the garden, they will earnestly cry day and night for deliverance. And God will not fail. He will deliver his people. Psalms 91 verse 2, I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God. In him will I trust. Verse 9, because thou hast, look at the condition. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. Friends, if we make the Lord our refuge now, and continue, no evil will befall us. Okay, that's the promise there in Psalms 91. The plague will not even come near your house. Verse 11. For he shall give his angels charge over thee. See, the Holy Spirit can withdraw from the earth. Christ can withdraw from the most holy in heaven. But the angels are still down here protecting his people. Charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. And there was a great earthquake such as, okay, let's look at the earthquake, great controversy 636, 637. The whole earth heaves and swells like the waves of the sea. That's amazing. I mean, we all used to seeing the wave when the sea when it's angry, you know, the waves. Eh? I haven't seen that on land yet. Its surface is breaking up. Its very foundations seem to be giving way. Mountain chains are sinking. Inhabited islands disappear. The seaports that have become like Sodom for wickedness are swallowed up by the angry waters. Babylon the Great has come in remembrance before God. And the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. A cup of the wine of God's wrath, Psalms 11 verse 6, Upon the wicked he shall rain snares, fire and brimstone and an horrible tempest. This shall be the portion of their cup. Matthew 26 verse 39, this is the same cup that Jesus drank in the garden of Gethsemane. And he went a little further and he fell on his face and prayed saying, Oh my father, 
If it be possible, let this cup pass from thee. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Friends, God's people will not taste of this cup here that comes with the plagues. The reason, because Jesus has already drunk of it on their behalf. Desire of Ages, 753. Satan with his fierce temptations wrung the heart of Jesus. The Savior could not see through the portals of the tomb. Hope did not present to him his coming forth from the grave a conqueror or tell of the Father's acceptance of the sacrifice. He feared that sin was so offensive to the Father that their separation was to be eternal. That's what the wicked got to feel at that time. Eternity, okay? Christ felt the anguish which a sinner will feel when mercy shall no longer plead for the guilty race. It was the sense of sin bringing the Father's wrath upon him as man's substitute that made the cup so bitter to drink and broke the heart of the Son of God. Right, number seven. And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent, that's about 60-something pounds, and men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. Job 3, 20, or Job, Job 38, sorry, verse 22. Hast thou entered into the treasures of the snow, or hast thou seen the treasures of the hail? Verse 23. Which I have reserved against the time of trouble, against the day of battle and war. Okay. See here in Job how God used the hail against his enemies. One talent is approximately 66 pounds in weight. That's just one hailstone. 66 pounds. No wonder when Jeremiah surveyed the surface of the earth, it was just all broken down. I mean, what's going to stand against the, these kind of hailstones? Jeremiah 4.26, I beheld and lo, the fruitful place was a wilderness. And all the cities thereof were broken down at the presence of the Lord and by his fierce anger. 27, for thus saith the Lord, for, for thus hath the Lord said, the whole land shall be desolate, yet, yet will I not make a full land. We praise the Lord, that give us hope. Okay. That's only the destruction part, but it's not a full land. God has something in store for his people. Jeremiah 29 verse 11. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. First John 2.25 This is the promise that he has promised us, even everlasting life. Friends, this is just the end of the sinful era, era of this world, just one stage, and after, that, after this is all over, then we go back to God's original plan. You know, God made man to live forever in the beginning. When sin came in, then plan B kick in. Okay? Not through God's will, but through our wrong choice, starting from Adam down. So the plan of salvation meant to deal with sin, close it up, and then come back to the original plan, eternity with God. May the Lord bless each one of you. Thank you. We're going to say a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your word that it can be a light for us in this dark world. We thank you, Father, for prophecy that we can look into the future. and We thank you for giving us hope. We thank you, Father, for your great love, your patience, and also your wisdom and strength. We commit our lives into your hands. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.